Wake that ass up early in the morning. The Breakfast Club. Morning, everybody. It's DJ Envy, Angela Yee, Charlemagne the Guy. We are The Breakfast Club. We got a special guest in the building. Yes, indeed. Dr. Freddie Haynes. Welcome, sir. Good morning, my brother. Good morning. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. You know, I learned something about you new this morning. I learned that your full name is Frederick Douglass Haynes III. Yes, sir. W- what is the significance of Frederick Douglass in your family that compelled well, everybody to adopt that name? Right. Well, my uh, grandfather, he was orphaned at the age of four. Mm-hmm. And as a consequence, he was raised by his aunt and his sister, and they called him Bubba. And this is in West Virginia back in, what, the early part of the last century? And when he first went to school, he didn't have a name because he had just been called Bubba. Mm. And so when he gets to school, the teacher says, what's your name? And at that moment, because he had been taught about Frederick Douglass, you know, he just adopted on the spot Frederick Douglass Haynes. Mm -hmm. And so he became you know, a civil rights a- activist, uh, one of the first. He was the first African-American to run for county supervisor in San Francisco. And so my my point with him is he taught me in life, you don't, what, discover who you are, you decide who you are. Ooh. And he did that at the age of nine. You know what's interesting? I was on vacation last week. I ran through three books, and I wish this was one of the first ones I read. This is the third one I read. I just started reading it. Oh, back. man, powerful. <laughs> the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Right. Powerful. I literally just started reading that, like, Three, four days ago. Powerful. He, yeah. He's he been a model for me because, again, he used his skills of oratory in mm-hmm. order to impact the world, set people free, and really change a nation. Yeah, and he made me feel like um, this is one of the reasons we have to be engaged with political leaders. Oh, no question. You know no what I'm question. saying? Like a lot of people like to call you, oh, you and Uncle Tom, you're still out if you're engaging with, with, with political leaders, but I think that you have to be. Right. As far as I'm concerned, he pushed Abraham Lincoln to do what Lincoln did. Absolutely. And so that is an unsung part of our history, uh, but you don't have an Emancipation Proclamation without the influence and the exertion of power that Frederick Douglass, who self-taught himself how to read, yeah. how to write, uh, and use that skill in order to impact a nation. There's people that think that church and politics should be separate, but clearly you're not one of those people. So talk about the importance of being political and being active when it comes to your civic duty in the church. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, we talk about this scripture that says the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. What's interesting is a definition of politics from a boy, Michael Eric Dyson, is politics is the art of what? Distributing resources. So if the earth belongs to God, and politics is about distributing resources, shouldn't God have something to say Mm. about how resources are distributed? Mm -hmm. And so when you look in the Bible and you see what? uh, Over a thousand scriptural references on justice. Justice Mm -hmm. should inform our politics. If it doesn't, then you have a lot of the junk that we have today. But a lot of the government, the government also uses the Bible to distort, you know. No uh, question society as well. No question, no question. I mean, sadly, the Bible has been misused and abused. I don't know if you, I'm sure you all have seen this, but there's a a, a piece down in D.C. now, uh, the Slave Bible, where in the 19th century, missionaries from uh, England took this Bible that was heavily edited. We like the word redacted today. Mm -hmm. They literally extracted from the Bible the Exodus, anything Jesus said about freedom, And that was the Bible they used to give to slaves. And so that DNA in the Christianity that's often mispracticed Mm -hmm. by a lot of white Christians is still operative today. It's an edited Bible Mm -hmm. that basically says we're going to redact out of it anything that deals with justice, because if we do that, then we've got to look at ourselves in the mirror and we're not going to like what we see. Yeah, because even when you read books like The Life and Narrative of Frederick Douglass or you watch movies like Birth of a Nation about Nat Turner, you see them slave masters beating oh, the man. slaves, but then oh, reading yeah. them scripture. Right, right, like, Obey right. your earthly master, right. things of that nature. Right, right. And so, again, there, there's an edited, redacted Bible that they read that comforts their conscience. Mm-hmm. And as a consequence, it's kind of like Shakespeare said, the devil cite scripture for his purpose. Mm-hmm. And so you have a whole lot of folk who have used the Bible for their own purpose, but they've often take what? They take text out of context for their pretext and they con people. Do you and think it, a lot of people are, are stepping away from the church now because it seems like it seems like the church is big business. It seems like people are, are into church and, and right. everybody's a pastor or reverend now because it's a, it's a way to get money. You got 12,000 uh, people attending your church. 
I mean, uh, so so again, everyone ain't stepping away from the church. You do have examples of churches that are still growing, and that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But we got to be real and recognize that there are a whole lot of people who basically, I mean, they say on social media all the time, that's why I don't go to church anymore. Mm -hmm. And they have examples that I understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, basically, if that was the only example I saw of church and witness, I'd basically say, you know, forget the church. Uh, but there are churches that will never get shine. They will never get a stage or a platform, but they're doing the real work. And because they're doing the real work, it's a reflection of their connection with God that manifests itself in what they do in the community. For, because for me, you don't have a church if that church is not impacting, serving, and making a difference, not only in individual lives, mm -hmm. but in the life of the community. How do you get people to believe in something like the Bible when you can say, all right, these parts of the Bible are BS, right. but these parts of the Bible are good? Like, right, right, no, no, so so for me, it's, it's important, again, text out of context often are pretext to con people, so, I'm always keeping the Bible in context. When you keep the Bible in context, A, you discover what a uh, brilliant, uh, brilliant biblical scholar Jerome Ross says, and that is none of Scripture was written without being in a context of oppression. And so you can't oh, read. Repeat that again now. None of Scripture okay. was written without being in a context of oppression. And so when we talk about what? The my involvement in politics and and economic development that is rooted in what a a bible that in many instances matter of fact jerome raw says in all instances except for a brief moment during the reign of david oppression was the uh political yeah, and yeah, economic yeah. context Absolutely. so you mean to tell me if all of that took place in the context of oppression that the Bible says nothing about oppression. The Bible says nothing about politics. I mean, Jesus got lynched on a cross. Right up. And, and, and again, that lynching took place handed down by the Roman Empire. And so why would he get lynched on a cross and he was not a threat to the Roman Empire? Absolutely. And so I think that a lot of times we take the text out of context. And if you keep the Bible in its context, then truth comes out. And so that's why, for me, uh, it's important. I mean, I, I, I love hip-hop big time. And one of the things I love about hip-hop, and, and people critique me, they talk about how why you use hip-hop uh, in your messages. So for me, it's about looking at what Jesus did. Jesus used what? The language of the culture. The yeah. Yeah. The culture for me. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when, I, when, I, when I talk hip-hop, I see it as truth from the culture to speak to the culture, to witness to the culture. And again, I'm still within the context of the Bible, which occurred in a context of oppression. What about people who use the context of the Bible to speak out against homosexuality? Well, again, I think that they're taking it out of context. If we're gonna keep it a buck, number one, you got eight passages of scripture that they misuse in order to abuse that community, mm -hmm. the LBGTQ community. Eight passages of scripture, maybe, because some of them, if we're honest, biblical scholars say they refer to uh, pedophilia. And because there is no word in Greek or Hebrew for homosexuality. So the bottom line is you got a lot of lying going on in order to justify uh, their own what? theological agenda which is rooted in their own psychological issues doesn't it say being that they never dealt with doesn't it say being gay no it says man on man is an abomination or something like that okay but again when you when, when you deal with it in 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 terms of the original language uh and again eight passages of scripture maybe mm -hmm. it's a big bible and you're gonna pick eight passages to be passionate about Okay, you got some issues I'm, that I'm real concerned about, right. especially when Jesus said the greatest commandment is to love your God, lo love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Especially when the dominant narrative of Jesus was love, and you use the Bible to hate on a community that you have issues with. And here's what gets me. The more you dig into those who use and misuse the Bible to abuse a community, the more you discover, huh, 
okay, who you been sleeping with? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> what's up with you? Yeah. And so uh, it's, it's kind of like, who was it? Uh, Strom Thurmond or Jesse Helms, who were such avid segregationists and racist. And they're sleeping with black women. Sleeping with black having women. Having babies by them. It was Strom so, Thurmond. So, so, so Might have been thing, both, but I definitely exactly, know Strom Thurmond. Exactly. So, so my thing is, you know, anybody who is passionately using the Bible in order to justify hatred, I'm concerned about your and issues. And that's part of the reason why I think a lot of people don't necessarily follow church as as they should, I guess you can say, because you pick certain things out and you say, well, if the Bible says this, then what about this? Right. How can the Bible possibly say this when this means that? And it's it's it, it just seems like some of that stuff cannot possibly be right. Because right. it's almost like that the, the old game you play. I'm, I'm gonna tell you something in your ear, and by the time Absolutely. it gets to 100 people, right. it's never the same thing, you know. Right. And that's how I feel like with the Bible and how some of the scriptures are being read. Right, no question. You can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say, mm -hmm. if again you take it out of context. Just like, I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream. One day, my kids will live in a nation judged not by the color of their skin, but content of character. So what do right right wing conservatives do? They take that text out of context to justify King must have said, I'm against affirmative action. Mm -hmm. <laughs> King must have said, I'm against this. You can make anything or anyone say whatever you want them to say and fit your agenda again if you take text out of context. That's why for me, I'm gonna always deal with, okay, what is the dominant theme that God is trying to drive in scripture love forgiveness Come on, there it is because yeah. if, love, if that's the case forgiveness freedom right. empowerment of the oppressed uh being concerned for those who are impoverished if you ain't dealing with that i mean i'm i'm, I'm real concerned about your interpretation because you didn't listen to the bible and the bible it says thou shall now shall not send my kid to Howard University. <laughs> and you said, you said your daughter to Howard. <laughs> so you're not listening to the Bible. <laughs> hey, shout out to the real HU. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about hip-hop that inspires you, though? Because you, you use hip-hop to not only reach young people, but you do put in your sermons. I've heard you quote Jay-Z, Nipsey Hussle. Like, what is it about hip-hop that inspires you? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, I mean, I've, I've done a sermon one Easter, for me, one of my best, uh, and was called The Breakfast Club because on, and you retweeted me when Angela Yee did that, I said, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I've made it now. But for me, on, on a serious tip, hip hop number one, as Michael Dyson says, you have poets and philosophers from the pavement who allow the streets to speak. Mm. And so, again, if I'm calling myself connected to Jesus, who really, again, put him in context, when you're reading the gospels, where do you find him most? In the slums, in the trenches. In the streets, yeah. in the slums, with the people. That's right. And so my thing is, if I'm not hearing from the streets, there's no way I can witness to the streets. If I'm not learning from the streets, there's a lot of wisdom in the streets. And so for me, I think it's very important that we recognize that hip hop is the most what? Admired, appropriated, and attacked culture on the planet, as far as I'm concerned. There's a reason for that. And one reason is because hip hop is not afraid to express truth in a raw fashion. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, you know, like, again, in the church, people get upset about what? Profanity. I'm saying, well, why aren't you upset about the profane conditions mm -hmm. that create the profanity? That's right. I mean, so, so, so for me, hip hop, I love hip hop, A, because of the fact that, again, it's, it, it keeps me connected to the streets. I love hip hop, number two, because hip hop has dared to say, you know what? We're not going to get pimped as talent. We're going to own our talent and build a black power base mm. for me. What's going on right now, when you look at what's happening with Jay-Z and so many others, we have, as far as I'm concerned, the most powerful expression of black power going on since the black power movement of the late 60s, early 70s, and hip-hop is carrying that ball. Why, why do you think you have rappers who are pretty progressive, attracted to ministers who are like very traditional right. and conservative in their views? Like, what do you make of that? Well, I mean, it's understandable because if 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 we're honest, most of the preachers who get airtime on what TBN and stations like that, mm -hmm. they're going to be conservative. Mm -hmm. And so if I go through a spiritual crisis 
and I recognize my need for God, I'm on television, I'm going to get turned on by who I see most. Absolutely. And so a lot of, of, of preachers who are doing the work and are theologically, what, down with the cause of justice, they're too busy doing the work to be on TBN. And so you'll never see a Michael McBride or a Gina Stewart or a, a Tracy Blackman on 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 TBN uh, because what they out in the streets doing the work and they're preaching a gospel that is not capitalist infused. It's not Americanized, therefore domesticating Jesus Christ and reducing Jesus to someone less than a revolutionary whose people turn the world upside down. So, again, if I go through my crisis and all I see are those who are on television. It's like a recognition. Boom. Now, what's the most difficult part you would say for your job as far as preaching the gospel, being an educator, being an activist? What is most stressful for you? Oh, wow. I mean, the fact that we live in a country where we could elect a 46 minus one, and that has created trauma, stress for a community that historically has always been already traumatized mm -hmm. and under so much That's stress. Right. And so right now, I mean, my counseling load has just elevated like crazy. Mm -hmm. And when I think about it, a lot that is behind it is the kind of nation we live in right now. And we're I, in the United States of anxiety as we speak. Well said. Well said. Well, this is the, the U.S. of A., the United States of anxiety. And it's the United States of anxiety, the United States that attacks black people. Mm -hmm. And so with that being the case, I mean, that just has elevated uh, stress. And so one one of the things, whenever we have a town hall, I always know as soon as the town hall ends, there's going to be a mass, you know, uh, the masses are going to come to me. Hey, I need this. Can you do this? I need this. And all too often I hurt because I don't have all the answers. Right. And, and, and there's so many problems that lack answers and there's so much work that we have to do. So, so right now, to be honest, it's just an overload. Mm -hmm and overload and and when you dare to talk about more than just you know personal piety but social critique and social activism that just adds to the load you know i um i had that conversation with bishop td jakes like you know you know prayer is great and faith is great but so is therapy yeah and you know he agreed and i think that's the thing i think sometimes pastors have been the backbone of the black community for so long and we right. go to pastors and we put our problems you know in y'all lap but right. sometimes y'all don't have all the answers sometimes right. it's not a scripture for everything sometimes right. you got to outsource and say you know what i got a therapist or psychiatrist you should talk to oh that's real talk and that's why we have thank god for dr brenda wall at friendship west uh and we've created a counseling community because again I can't do it all. And so we have that counseling community that creates healing. As far as I'm concerned, Bishop Jakes has done a phenomenal job of, of creating a climate where it really is okay for black folk to say, mentally, I'm not as healthy as I need That's to right. be. And he's done a brilliant job of that. And so I think more churches need to take on that model that basically says, ain't no stigma with actually addressing your issues of anger, abandonment, depression, anxiety, you know, insecure, whatever those issues may be. You know, that's why Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. OK, but he did not say I'll give you rest just through the pastor. But even when you when you bring up all of that stuff, anxiety, insecurity, people will dismiss it. Oh, that's just the devil. That's just all in your head. You're just making excuses. Yeah, give it right. to God. You need to give your life to God. Yeah. And then they the most insecure people you'll find. <laughs> and and on top of that, you know, you check their blood pressure and it's through the roof. Yeah. And yet you want me to pray for that. Well, again, prayer must also go with performance, faith and works. And so if you don't have the works with the faith, you end up dead. Mm. Yeah, that, that's my remix on that. What do you think about, you know, you see a lot of these, I call them TV pastors and TV preachers. And, you know, what's, what's your opinion on that? I, I remember a couple of years ago, one uh, preacher was trying to, he, he had a GoFundMe to get his jet. He wanted his private jet. Oh, that Cleflo Dollar, right? I think that's Cleflo Dollar. I don't remember who it was. But what, what, Cleflo, right? What, what do you yeah. think about those preachers and pastors? I just don't. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest with you. There's so much work to be done out here. Our communities are suffering and struggling. And so I, I just can't give that 
energy. Uh, I mean, I, I, I hope that they will recognize that there are a whole lot of folk who never will get to fly, and they don't get to fly not because they don't have a GoFundMe account, but they don't get to fly because there's an education system that's whack, uh, that has precluded uh, their own ability to become all that God wants them to become. Uh, number two, uh, they are, what, sentenced to communities that have become, uh, some call them, what, food deserts. I call it food apartheid because a desert is a natural phenomenon. Apartheid is man-made. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a food desert. It's food apartheid. Uh, and and within, a, within food apartheid, you're going to have what? Uh, job apartheid, educational apartheid, opportunity apartheid. All of that exists, and it's created by us. And so, so when you're flying around doing your thing, God bless you, but don't forget about those. Like there, there was a piece out years ago. Someone was talking about money cometh. Well, my thing is money can't cometh if you can't get a jobeth and go to worketh. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I ain't going to lie, though, doctor. I think pastors should get paid. Because I think that they really I mean, are not doing what like paid. Yeah. No, I'm talking about I think they should get paid in the rap. Have you ever heard Bishop? You've heard Bishop T.D. Jake speak. Oh, my God. He's Man, a phenom. If, if we paying all these rappers that yeah. got bars, right. all and, this money, and Jake's who got, got better bars, bars than Bishop T.D. Jakes? It don't get no better. And he's yeah. giving back to the community in a real way. I don't have a problem oh. with, with, with oh pastors getting paid. I just have a problem when... I wouldn't I, ask I directly for a jet. jet. If you ask the congregation, yeah, yeah, you're yeah, asking people for a jet. That's that's my whole thing. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. You know, but... They should get paid, absolutely. Since you were talking about speaking, you do have this book, Rocking the World with Your Words, an Thank essential you. guide to developing and delivering a life-changing message. Right, it's on, it's on the way out. Uh, you all have the first copies, and so uh, you can pre -order, I right? appreciate uh, you can. Yeah, you go to fdhministries.org. Uh, it will be out on Amazon soon. But uh, the whole uh, intent behind the book is that uh, I've been accused of being a pretty decent public speaker, and mm -hmm. so I've been asked, okay, what do you do? And so uh, my whole thing is I want to rock the world with my words. And so I, I, I even deal with how you find your voice uh, through your what? Past, your personality, as well as, you know, what God has uniquely done through you uh, and wants to accomplish through you by way of purpose. And so we talk about all of that uh, that goes behind informing not only, you know, what you say, but how you say it. Because there are certain phrases that always stick out in our heads, right? Of oh, speeches yeah. Speeches that people have given yeah. that are forever just uh, embedded in our minds. Oh, my question. I mean, I mean, we've, we've again talked about Bishop Jake's uh, woman thou art loose. I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's a classic <laughs> phrase. This Bishop T.D. Jake's and tortoise then, in the giraffe. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I mean, and, then, and then, you know, one of our favorites here, Michael Eric Dyson. Mm -hmm. You don't get any better when it comes to oratory. And he's also a preacher and a teacher than Michael Eric Dyson. Beast. But again, Michael Eric Dyson has personality. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a sense of purpose. And all of that adds to the profundity of his presentation. Dyson is a beast, no question. And he's not talking over your head. Not at all. Not you know at all. Be because what Dyson does, again, Dyson remains connected to the streets. And as a consequence of that, he speaks to the streets. But, you know, he can also get on MSNBC, That's right. CNN, anyone. And you can't really hang with Mike because Mike... Again, when it comes to what rationale, when it comes to eloquence, nobody does it better than Michael Eric Dyson. I want to ask you something. You know, you, you, I, I can see how you can take like a Drake or a Jay Z and use their ideas and titles for sermons, but what about rappers who aren't as apparent as them? So I want to give you a few rappers. Okay. All right. And 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 you tell me what ideas you take from them and what the okay. title of their sermons may look like. Right. Cardi B. Oh, Cardi B. I mean, Cardi B. There's so many because. I, I could literally biographically preach Cardi B and call my subject, do you, boo? <laughs> why, why? Because she unapologetically, unashamedly is herself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's such a powerful and beautiful thing. And so I, I could just do a full sermon on the power of, of self-definition mm. and basically saying, you know, damn what other people say about you and think about you, do you boo, because that's who God made you to be. Mm. And then, of course, she has that line that just kills me, you know, uh, knock me down nine times, get back get up ten. ten. Yeah. I mean, that's life. So, so uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I could preach Cardi B like 
Uh, all right, let's throw it back a little bit. Old Dirty Bastard. ODB. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so here's the deal. Like, my mother hears me preaching, and so I can never get up and quote, Old Dirty Bastard. But now Old Dirty Bastard has a story. Old, Old Dirty Bastard uh, is, is, a, is a brilliant lyricist, and so you cannot deny that. Uh, but again, when my mom's is listening, mm -hmm. I, I, I just can't call his name like that. Well, he that. says that because there's no father to his style. Right. So that could right. be a good sermon Which for is you. brilliant. Mm -hmm. Which is brilliant. So again, I would say ODB. Uh, mm -hmm. If my mama's sitting out there, if she's not, then I'll go with, you know, yeah, no father to my style. I love that. <laughs> what yeah. about two chains? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so y'all are killing me. Uh, but, <laughs> Just making but, you think a little bit. No, you're all. making me think deep, man. You you're making me think deep. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, cause, cause I'm, I'm going back on that. Uh, well, give, a, give us a classic one that you've done about Jay-Z or Nipsey. For those who've never heard the good Dr. Freddie Haynes speak. Oh, wow. I mean... So, so one of my favorite with Jay is going to always be his line when he talks about, uh, I mean, he, he do, 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 does this piece with his dad uh, when he talks about how uh, my pops got a liver disorder. I just got his living room order. My whole living's disordered. Mm. And so, you know, how life can fall apart when we're setting everything up, you know. And so I've, I've tried to unpack that. Uh, one of my favorite lines of Jay is going to always be uh, when he talks about uh, Sunset Hove, how you get so fly. I said, from not being afraid to fall out the sky. Mm. Uh, I mean, that's taking risk. It, that's faith. Faith is taking a risk. Mm. And so sometimes you've got to basically say, I ain't afraid to fall out the sky. I ain't afraid to take a chance because you're not going to walk by faith and live in a comfort zone. Mm. If you walk by faith, every now and then, you're going to fall out the sky. And so then he goes on to say, I'd rather die enormous than to live, live dormant. dormant. That's how we own it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about Nipsey? I know you did something oh, about Nipsey, man, too. Man, Nip. God bless the dead. And, and, yeah, and, and, and for me, two levels. Number one, it's not just his lyrics. It's his, his, his life. Uh, because, I mean, in L.A., out there making a difference. And you said this, man, and, and, and I think I, I, I want to shout out everyone who's doing this. You said this. You said there are Nipsey hustles in every community who may never get shine, but they're doing it. And for me, you got black churches that are Nipsey hustles in their community. They're buying blocks. They're doing things mm -hmm. to make a difference. And so on one level, I lift up the life of Nip because of his actions. At the same time, I mean, his message uh, especially in dedication. Uh, I mean, dedication is just loaded. Uh, you talk about how, uh, you know, for every, every life situation, Jay-Z has a lyric mm -hmm. or a bar. And I want to say that, you know, Nip was on his way to doing the same thing yeah, if he had been allowed to live, uh, to live longer. And so, uh, again, for me, one of my favorite with him is going to have to be, this ain't for entertainment, this is for the niggas on the slave ship, these songs just are spirituals, I swam against them waves with. Mm. I mean, that's powerful because it's a shout out to the ancestors who survived the, the hell of the Middle Passage, and this thing is, I ain't just doing this for entertainment, this is giving me the strength, these are my spirituals, I'm swimming against the waves of oppression and racism. I'm mm. swimming anyhow. So, uh, yeah, neighborhood nip. I now, mean, wow. Now, question, if, if if you could ask the man upstairs one question, mm -hmm. what would the question be? Oh, wow. Just one. This has been private up until you made me go public. Uh, why have black folk caught so, so much hell for so long? Mm. Yeah. I ask that question often, too. Yeah. But, I mean, doesn't the Bible speak on... Um, us being the chosen ones, and there's going to uh, uh, be a time after 400 years where where the last shall be first. I know I'm I know I'm taking it all out of context, but isn't it something? Isn't it something along those lines? I mean, You're maybe a great I'm a biblical scholar. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but 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 on on a serious tip, I mean, for me that is real. It's just that okay within the context of 400 years, you've had, you know, our sister who died last year. Uh, who was raped in Alabama. Oprah gave a shout out to her, and I'm sorry, her name escapes me right now. Uh, she um, gets raped uh, in 1944 and dies last year, and justice was never served. Mm. And so 
I get, and I'm with you on that, I promise you I am, that yeah, 400 years of oppression, no doubt, God's going to turn the table. But it's during those 400 years that so many innocent people get killed. You know, during those 400 years, Eric Garner can't breathe and now he's dead. During those 400 years, Trayvon Martin, his life is aborted for those of you in the right wing community. 400 years, Tamir Rice, 12 yeah. years old, life aborted. The brother Elijah who just got killed last week, yeah. throat slit for listening to his rap music But listen to rap music, yeah. you know? And so, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, God, I love you. I know you up to something. I know, I know this thing is going to change soon. But in the meantime, the meantime has been so mean to those who find themselves under the iron of oppression in this country. Why do you think black people are so forgiven when it comes to that? We talk about that a lot. Come to that like, damn Bible. Like, we're so forgiven. <laughs> damn Bible with that, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I didn't mean it like that, but you know it's because <laughs> of that Bible, though. No, 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 yeah. that, that's real. And, and, and I would say the damnable way that the Bible is misused in order to abuse people. And so we, we, we and, and, and one of my favorite people is a brilliant woman, a scholar, Dr. Stacy Floyd Thomas. She says this, uh, DJ, and that is, it ain't that we're forgiving, we're accepting. Why? Because she says there's a difference between forgiving and accepting. When you forgive, it presupposes you have power. Jesus says, forgive us our debts. That means you owe me. I'm in a position of power. Mm -hmm. So I forgive you because I have the power to do that. Mm. And so you're talking about people who ain't got power. What was that shit mean? Yeah. Cause I like <laughs> that. Do. I'm gonna tell you, no, go ahead, I'm gonna tell you why I love like that. Breast. Yeah, I know, why did you just do that? that? That's crazy. So you're talking Sorry. about people who are powerless talking about forgiving? No. No, we you're, can't. You're, you're, you're accepting Yes. But you're not forgiving because you're not in a position to do that. You ain't got the power to do that. Mm. And so as far as I'm concerned, it ain't that we're forgiving. We've been accepting. Woo. And until we deal with the difference, the sad reality is we're going to keep on accepting what we shouldn't accept, which precludes us from ever gaining real power. Did you see the Emmanuel documentary about the church shooting in Charleston, Man, South yeah. Carolina? Oh, yeah. They, there's a part where they show everybody forgiving that white devil, right, yeah, for, yeah. for what he did. Right. But somebody said in the doc that you forgive when you, when you realize you're not going to do anything about what actually happened. Right. So right. it's like, that's true. If you're a powerless right. person, it's right. like, yeah, I, I, I forgive you because you, you don't have no other choice. Right, right. So you accept it. You accept it. You yeah. accept it. And, and there has to come a time when Ooh. we say, I ain't accepting this no more. Got to get your Nat and, Turner and, on. And, and then we get our power. Come on, yeah. yeah. And get your Nat Turner on, yeah. Then Mark Vesey. Come on. Who are all Gabriel very Prosser. heavy into the church, by the way. All of them preachers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My kind of preacher. <laughs> yeah. And we appreciate you for joining, man. Mm. The book, Rocking the World with Your Words. Yeah, Freddie, Dr. This, Frederick Haynes. This can't be your last time up here, my brother. Oh, man, thank you. I'm, I'm honored. My, my daughter turned me on to the Breakfast Club years <laughs> ago. She Even while she works for me, uh, I know that there's a certain time of day I ain't even going to talk to her because she's <laughs> she watching The Breakfast Club. Well, we appreciate her, even though she went to Howard. Right. We still yeah, appreciate shout out to her. Daughter. And, Fre and Frederick is really who he says he is. I met him out in the streets. Oh, I man. met you outside doing yeah. the work. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he is who he says he is. Well, thank I you for joining it. us again. I appreciate you all so much. Please keep up the great work and keep challenging these folk who are running for office. Because what you've done that I love so much is that this election is not going to settle for symbolic politics. Mm -hmm. If you ain't dealing with black issues, don't even come to the black community. And you all are making candidates actually face up to what are you going to do? What's your vision for black people? Because we deserve to have our agenda and not just be taken for granted. And if it ain't for the Breakfast Club, a whole lot of folk would just slide on through. And so I want to thank you because as far as I'm concerned, even this past weekend in uh, in New Orleans, at when Essence Festival, yeah, uh, yeah that, at, at Essence, uh, when Kamala <laughs> made her statement, as far as I'm concerned, it was birthed when she got confronted right here at the breakfast. She's coming back up here this week. Good, that's my girl. Right. So you so you like Senator Harris? Well, uh, full disclosure, I'm from San. I grew up in San Francisco. Okay. So uh, yeah, I've I've met her and uh, got mad appreciation for her and. Yeah. Do you think a lot of her criticism is warranted about her being a prosecutor and things of that nature? 
I think some of it is unfair. I also think she needs to do a better job of sharing what she did beyond prosecuting. Uh, because, again, I know her. So she invited me to a meeting with her uh, when she was DA in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And during that conversation, she shared with me, she basically is the architect of the whole smart on crime movement. Mm-hmm. But she's not getting credit for it. I'm in Dallas. We had, an, we had a district attorney, Craig Watkins, who went to her in San Francisco. Craig gets a whole lot of play because Craig, what? He got all those people exonerated under his tenure as a DA, during his tenure as DA. But he learned what he did from Kamala Harris. Mm. She hadn't gotten that message out. And because of that, she's allowed others to basically dictate her narrative. And I think she got to speak up. Well, we're going to play this clip this week when she comes up here. So, yeah. And, and let her discuss I like it herself. Because you was, was on Tell the ground. I appreciate her, yeah. So, you know about the back on track program and oh, all yeah. that. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, again, she's done great work, but that narrative is not the dominant one right now. Right. Which is interesting because three years ago when I first got turned on to her, that is why I got turned on to her Thank because you. of the progressive things she was doing yeah. and with criminal justice reform. So, yeah. it, it was confusing. When all of that came out this year, like she was a cop and all of this and that. Yeah. And yeah. she has this whole homeowners plan now that she's been discussing. $100 billion plan for black Specifically homeowners. Specifically for black right. homeowners. Mm-hmm. And again, as far as I'm concerned, because she got challenged at the Breakfast Club, okay, what what you going to do for black folk? Right. Mm-hmm. And every single person running for office, as far as I'm concerned, if we don't tell, ask them that, we're just playing games. Well, thank My you man. for joining us again, bro. Give me your Twitters man, and Instagrams you. and all that stuff too, Fred. Oh, yes. I'm on Twitter at... F H unscripted, and uh, that's also my Instagram, which is run by my daughter uh, Howard, and uh, <laughs> and then on uh, Facebook Frederick D Haynes. Oh, Envy, right. and Envy going to look and see how much followers you got right now. That's why you ain't got no followers. Cause you got somebody from Howard. Running. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Breakfast Club. Good morning. <laughs>